Hi, my name is Marshall, and today I'm here to talk to you about cooking in Hamilton Hall, a 215-year-old gathering space in Salem, Massachusetts. We're going to talk about a man who was born when Massachusetts was a colony of England and worked as an apprentice in Salem under the local merchant John Appleton, who lived near Hamilton Hall. He was initially known as Benjamin Thompson, but left the United States for Europe during the American Revolution and was later given a title as Count Rumford, partly because of his many scientific achievements in the science of cooking and heat. Count Rumford made huge advancements in the realm of cooking, thermodynamics, and general science, which you can still see today. One of Count Rumford's biggest achievements was in his experiments with heat transfer used in cooking. Today we are going to talk about the three methods of heat transfer, radiation, conduction, and convection, and show how all three methods were used to cook at Hamilton Hall. Benjamin Thompson was born in 1753 and died in 1814, and was similar to Benjamin Franklin, always thinking of ways to improve his life. He invented the Rumford fireplace, the Rumford roaster, the double boiler, and a type of coffee percolator. His scientific discoveries actually made him a celebrity, and the students who worked under him followed in his constant spirit of discovery. Hamilton Hall was built in 1805 as a place for people to gather, but the ground floor was home to the Ramond family an African-American family comprised of John and Nancy and their ten children. They were successful business people and prepared meals at Hamilton Hall, sometimes for crowds of up to 150 people. They even had a restaurant at the hall and cooked for gatherings in the hall and elsewhere around town. Cooking for 150 might sound daunting compared to the usual sub-ten-person Thanksgiving dinners you're used to, but having three different cooking methods in the kitchen at the hall made it possible, along with the hard work of the Ramon family. The first method of cooking available to Hamilton Hall was a beehive oven. Beehive ovens have been around for centuries, and Hamilton Hall has two of them, one large in the main kitchen and another small one in the little kitchen. They have the same size door, but one has a much larger space and size to cook more food. Beehive ovens were essential in a kitchen that cooked and baked for so many people like this in Hamilton Hall. This is because they were incredibly versatile. Traditionally in a bakery, the fire would be started in the oven early in the morning, and once bricks in the oven were ripping hot, the fire would be put out, but the bricks would retain heat for hours afterwards and the baking process could begin. Bread could be cooked in the morning when the oven was hottest, cakes and custards at midday, and later on in the day, the temperature would have still been warm enough to dry fruits and vegetables without actually cooking them. This was incredibly synergistic in a kitchen, and it allowed the oven to be efficiently used all day. The beehive oven is an example of radiation, a method of heat transfer that doesn't require direct contact. The food isn't directly touching the hot surface of the oven for the most part, instead the hot part radiates heat towards the food. The easiest way to visualize this is, surprisingly enough, with a radiator. While modern ovens don't require us to start a fire by hand, if you take the bottom grate off of it you can actually see the heating element. This is what's radiating heat. Election Cake. This is from a 1947 cookbook that was published as a fundraiser for Hamilton Hall, so if any of the three recipes I'm doing are authentic, it's this one. Traditionally, election cake would be eaten every presidential or government election as a way for housewives to contribute through baking since they weren't able to vote. The recipe was dated enough to call for cake yeast, but I'm using dry yeast since I couldn't get a hold of any cakes. I'm playing this in real time, you can see the yeast rise. They're actually eating the sugar, and I think it's pretty fascinating. I'm also going to scald the milk and butter together. I've seen differing opinions on whether this is important, especially with the current pasteurization process, which kills off bacteria. But the most important thing scalding milk does is it denatures the whey proteins in the milk. When you have fewer of these whey proteins, you can form longer groups of gluten strands that contribute to a chewier texture. This gives any cake or bread the ability to hold more air. Here's our fully bloomed yeast. You don't want to directly add the scalded milk to it because the high temperatures will kill the yeast, but if you let it sit on your counter for a little bit, it will be warm and you'll be totally fine. In other words, you want the milk to be warm enough to activate the yeast, but not so hot it will kill it. I'm adding two cups of sugar and one cup of cold milk. The cold milk is further going to regulate that temperature. And after that, just a pinch of salt. I've heard people say that salt kills yeast, but in a quantity this small, it's not going to be an issue. It's actually going to regulate the yeast so it doesn't overrise. After that, we can add our scalding milk and butter and then fix this up. 
Next, we're going to add three eggs in a bowl. As I'll mention later, eggs act as an emulsifier in cakes and breads, which allows fats and waters to stay together and contributes to more final moisture in the product. We're using bread flour for this too. Initially, I was skeptical because the fluffy texture of cakes depends on low gluten content products like cake flour, but the higher gluten content here will allow it to retain more air bubbles, and that's what they would have been doing at the time. In other words, using cake flour is important when you're baking without yeast, but when you're baking with yeast, bread flour could actually be better for cakes. Our tastes for cakes have definitely changed. Our spice choices here are cinnamon and nutmeg. The original recipe called for mace, but I couldn't get my hands on any, and I doubt you'll be able to. And since mace is simply the outside of the nutmeg seed, it'll have a similar flavor. This is it after about 6 hours of rise. In the 1800s it would have taken at least overnight to get to this level, but just like any modern livestock or crop, yeast is cultivated to be fast and efficient. We're going to transfer this into two bread pans now with a towel on top. I was safe in assuming that bread pans are the same 9x5 size they were in 1947, otherwise this could have risen to a disastrous level. Don't try making it in an 8x4 bread pan. After these are done proofing, you can transfer them to a 350 degree oven for about an hour. Mine took 45 minutes. Since everybody's oven is different, they should be done when you insert a toothpick and it comes out clean. And the selection cake was interesting. The yeast was crazy active in my final product. You could definitely taste that funky flavor it provides, and I think it worked better with the dry cherries and raisins than it did on its own. While this might taste weird to your modernized and westernized palate, I think it's definitely worth giving a try. Yeast cake might be something you really fall in love with, and even, even just watching the yeast is a lot of fun. The second cooking method available to the hall is the Rumford Fireplace, which uses conduction. The Count Rumford Fireplace was Benjamin Thompson's most popular and important invention for a couple of reasons. First, it was vastly more efficient than a normal fireplace because it had angled corners that directed heat into the room. Since you know what radiation is, you know that these corners radiate heat into the room. An older traditional fireplace, which had a square firebox, could easily be converted to a Rumford fireplace, making this a pretty easy upgrade. Most importantly, the Rumford fireplace added a choke in the chimney. This increased the flow of smoke up the chimney by creating a convection current. You'll learn more about that later. Cold outside air could flow down, while hot air and smoke would be sucked up preventing the choking of the residents that so often happened with traditional chimneys. Conduction is the easiest of the three methods to visualize directly as heat goes from one object to another through contact. Here's a mock turtle soup recipe that's a pretty good way to showcase conduction cooking. Keep in mind nothing is authentic about this at all, it doesn't even use real turtle, but it's a pretty fun way to see the use of conduction. I'm using a mixture of two parts beef and one part chicken. I heard turtle described as having a very beefy flavor, but the textural contrast provided by the chicken will get you closer to a turtle, i.e. their fins have a different texture and flavor from their internal organs. This boiling raw meat looks horribly unappetizing, but that will get better as we go along. Don't worry about it. I'm adding half of the onions I chopped earlier, some salt, and some cayenne pepper. The cayenne won't really make this dish spicy, but it will wake up the flavors at the end. After this has been simmering for a while, the meat's done. I'm going to separate this so we can use that liquid for soup base without overcooking the meat. I'm making a roux now. Traditionally, you do this just by adding some flour to melted butter and stirring until it's brown, but I found that by adding it to the onions, because of their moisture, it's a lot harder to burn this. Normally, when you make a roux, it can be difficult, and you'll burn a couple before you get it right, but this I got right on the first try. After that, some Worcestershire sauce, and after that, tomato paste. Tomato paste is really rich, so just be careful with how much you use. For our final assembly, I'll add some hard-boiled eggs. And finally, putting the meat back in. So here's your final project. I give this a 5 out of 10. Overall, it wasn't incredible, but I had no trouble finishing it at all, so I'll put it right in the middle. The final cooking method in Hamilton Hall is the Rumford Roaster, and it is the most complicated but interesting part of the hall in my opinion. The Rumford Roaster is the first convection oven ever made, and it plays a huge part in the hall's ability to cook for so many people. This is because it drastically decreased cooking time. Here's a cool way to visualize this. If you sit in an ice bath, at first it'll be freezing cold, but if you sit totally still, after a while it'll warm up. This is your body heat raising the temperature of the surrounding water. 
However, if you slosh the water around and change position, it'll feel freezing cold again. This is the same reason the convection oven speeds up cooking. The food is constantly in contact with fresh hot particles of air and it cooks faster as a result. Modern convection ovens simply use a fan to regulate airflow, but a regular oven can have some convection as well. If you watch a pot of boiling water, the hottest water rises to the top close to the middle and then falls to the bottom to be heated again. This can happen in a regular oven with air, but the Rumford Roaster speeds it up by adding a chimney and air vents. Air flows up the chimney, which sucks colder air through the vents on the bottom. This colder air is heated by the firebox, and then it flows over the food, effectively creating an air current. Alright, so chocolate chip cookies. A simple, well-known recipe which is really good for displaying the efficiency of convection ovens, and also potentially the power of baking powder. I'm doing a weird quarter batch of a recipe I found online called the worst chocolate chip cookies, so I won't give you specifics on ingredients and quantities, but I'll explain what I'm doing. This starts with some melted butter, plain white sugar, and brown sugar. Brown sugar adds some well-needed moisture and nutty flavor that the regular sugar lacks. This is because there's molasses in it. After that, eggs. Eggs and cakes actually act as an emulsifying agent like I mentioned earlier. The eggs allow oil and water to combine, which would usually separate. If you want, you can visualize this by adding some water and oil to a bowl. They'll separate no matter how hard you mix them, but add an egg, and once the mixture is together, it'll stay like that. Functionally, in addition, this will maintain moisture and create a more homogeneous product. I'd also like you to pay attention to the way I'm mixing these, very vigorously. This is to introduce air bubbles, which I'll talk about when we talk about leavening agents. Now I'm going to add some vanilla and after that maple syrup. If you haven't tried maple syrup in your chocolate chip cookies, I definitely recommend it. It doesn't exactly make them taste like maple syrup, but it'll elevate the texture to a whole new level and increase their shelf life. After this, flour, salt, baking soda, and baking powder. Baking powder is actually another invention closely related to Rumford. He never returned to the U.S. after the Revolutionary War, but he endowed a physics and chemistry lab at Harvard late in his life, which was pretty well suited to study food science. While working at the lab in 1843, Alfred Byrd invented baking powder, and since he was the Rumford professor, he named the company he made the Rumford Baking Company. You can still buy it under that name today. Baking powder works by including a dry acid, usually cream of tartar, a dry base, usually baking soda, and a filler, in this case cornstarch. When these ingredients combine in solution, that's when they get wet, the interaction between the acid and the base causes a chemical reaction that creates air bubbles. The air bubbles I talked about incorporating earlier are the reason these two bubbles do anything. They're going to make the cake a lot more fluffy. If you hadn't mixed anything and never really have air bubbles in the mixture to begin with, the CO2 is going to be ineffective and you're going to have a flat cake. Double-acting baking powder can also contain sodium aluminum phosphate, which breaks down and creates CO2 bubbles in the presence of heat. The usefulness of baking powder really can't be understated. Before its inventions, all baked goods relied on having yeast in them, which is not only inconvenient and time-consuming, but it has a very specific flavor that doesn't exactly work well with every other flavor. Think sourdough and strawberries, that's not exactly a great combination. Baking powder opened baking up to potentially include a lot more recipes in addition to its time saving. So what I'm doing now is incorporating my chocolate chips into this mixture. Every additional stage is going to add more air bubbles into the mixture which results in a less dense product in the end. I'm putting these in a small bowl, they're going to go in the fridge for about 30 minutes. This step isn't required, but it'll stop them from spreading out so much on the baking sheet, resulting in prettier cookies that aren't going to touch each other. So now over to the oven. This is a quick time lapse of the cooking process. It took 17 minutes for these cookies on the normal oven setting, and they come out looking pretty good. I really like the way these came out. I definitely recommend trying this recipe. I also did them on convection, all the same settings, but the fan was blowing the hot air around the oven, and they only took 14 minutes. That's about a 20% reduction in cooking time, which is incredibly valuable when you're talking about large-scale production. And you can also see the air bubbles at the end. They're kind of understated in cookies compared to something like muffins or cake, but they're definitely still there, and the baking powder is definitely still doing its job. So there you have it. Three different methods of heat transfer, and three different methods of cooking in Hamilton Hall, and three recipes you can try at home. I think it's really fascinating to get a glimpse of what life would have been like 200 years ago just through cooking. And I also think you'll have a lot of fun trying these recipes.